Welcome back into the early line. It's hour number two right here on Sports Twitter. Kevin Walsh joined by Donnie Wright's side. And in this hour, we will preview almost every new market available in the FanDuel Sportsbook when we talk about the second half of this upcoming baseball season. We have updated win totals, and we have a really nice opportunity to go through the make-miss playoff markets there to figure out these AL and NL wild card races. But we begin at the bottom. Who will have baseball's worst record? Right now, the Nationals are the favorite in this market at a minus 120. What really jumps out to me, though, is how it materializes past the Nationals. Plus 190 on the A's, 17 to 1 when you get to that third choice, though, on the Kansas City Royals. 19 to 1 on the Reds, 30 to 1 on the Pirates. Here's my initial question to you, Donnie. Is that Nationals number factoring in a departing Juan Soto? Uh, yes, and also the other extenuating circumstances now that we take a look at Strasburg, who apparently is not coming back. This is one of those teams, Kevin, that we look at at a minus-120 price. They should be the favorite in the clubhouse because this is one of those teams that you figure will bottom out for the remainder of the season for me. So the Nationals right now are the worst team yeah. in baseball, but it is not by some unreachable margin. Just one and a half games worse than the Oakland Athletics. Six games in the loss column worse than both the Reds and the Cubs. To give you an idea of kind of where these teams start to line up. But I do think you make a good point here. Because it's not just the departing Juan Soto, though it has a lot to do with it. Strasburg's now shut down. Patrick Corbin might be departing potentially in a trade. And I know your initial thought's going to be, whoa, 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 Patrick Corbin. This guy's terrible. The ERA is almost the six. Tell me if I'm wrong here, Donnie. But Patrick Corbin's like the second starter on this baseball team. So if Patrick Corbin leaves, it probably means someone even worse is going to be coming up behind him. No, it's a great point you bring up because, again, this is one of those arguments I make against Major League Baseball. You would figure the Nationals, okay, retooling. Uh, Corbin moves on. Well, Corbin hasn't been that great of a pitcher. Let's bring up our top prospect pitcher who can get, you know, hit the ground running, no pressure in the second half of the season. It's not the way how baseball works. You saw it in the past. Like Anibal Sanchez are the guys that you call up and say, hey, you have no business being in Major League Baseball, but there's three guys behind you in our minor league system that are 22, 23, and 24. They're ready to come up, but we don't want to pay them yet. So Anibal, you're going to get 10 starts between August and September. Have some fun out there, and maybe you'll take a picture and remember this for the rest of your life. That's how it's going to work for the Nationals because just because some of these players are moving on that are veterans that you figure like, hey, give some of the young kids a chance. They don't do that in baseball. You don't bring up your best players in baseball because you don't want to pay those guys. You actually bring up the guys who have no future in Major League Baseball, and that's what the Nationals will certainly start to do. Now, if I do play devil's advocate here, we have heard that the Nats are not just going to seek high-level prospects but they'd love some ready-made Major League Baseball players. If in sending out Juan Soto and Patrick Corbin, they bring three regular starters to their roster, is it going to make them markedly better? No, I don't think so. It's, again, why a team would be willing to trade those players out to bring Juan Soto into their baseball team. However, they might not be as useless as we initially think. The Oakland Athletics are going to be a team who are right here in the mix. Their number, just plus 190. The expectation is probably they send out a Frankie Montas. I don't know if they're sneaky upset that Paul Blackburn got himself some reps in an all-star game. I don't think he's going to be on his way out. But their staff has been okay in certain parts. Our radio audience is here as well on a Wednesday morning. Kevin Walsh, Donnie, right side of the early line, Sirius XM. Channel 159. Donnie, for you, is it as simple as if it's not the Nats, it has to be the A's who check in at plus 190? You're probably right because they're going to be in the same boat here. Whatever, you know, parts they have, they're going to strip bare bones here down at the break, or excuse me, at the uh, trade deadline and move those guys. And also, just another comment about the Oakland Athletics. It's kind of interesting. You have a billionaire owner who specifically wants everybody to stay away from their ballpark in order for him to make money because he wants to move and show baseball how dire it is. You have an all-star pitcher who earned his right to the all-star game and I believe was in Houston, and they said, hey, man, congratulations. You made the all-star team. Here is your Spirit Airlines coach middle seat. Fly to the all-star game and have a good time. The Astros heard about this. Hey, man, look, we got four or five guys. We got a private jet flying up to L.A. Why don't you come sit young? You're on the opposing team here. 
come on over with us. We'll treat you right. And you saw it at the All-Star game when they interviewed Blackburn. He's like, hey, man, he was really nice to those guys. Like, I guess they heard I was flying coach to the All-Star game. And he said, why don't you fly with us private? We'll take care of you. It's amazing how the Oakland Athletics are able to get away with this at a Major League Baseball level at this point. But Mo Pro- plus 190, where's the good vibes in that locker room? Hey, guys, fight it out to the mm-hmm. end of the season. Do the best you can. What, are you kidding me in Oakland? And that, there's only so much that can be traded off of this team anyway, right? I mean, yeah, exactly. could Paul Blackburn be like on the move? Gatorade Maybe, machine. right? Yeah, Monta. And here, you're like, ah, they might get rid of Sean Murphy. And you might say, I mean, take him. The guy bats 241. That's the best batting average on the team. That is the yeah. best batting average on the team. Let me make one more complaint here quickly, and then we'll move on. The third and fourth cursed, uh, worst record currently in baseball belongs to the Reds and the Cubs. And you know what they're advertising last night on the All-Star game? Field of Dreams game between the Reds and the Cubs. Uh, How'd that happen? How did They went from <laughs> Yankees, White Sox, two teams with major expectations, Donnie, and they said, oh, we actually yeah. don't need to give, what, good baseball teams to this product? And we've yeah. got Reds, Cubs going out there? you got to be kidding me. Yeah, it's bad. That's bad news for baseball. But I guess they figure everyone is going to watch anyway, regardless if it's double-A talent out on that baseball yes. field. No, they're not. That's the thing they're going to find out. No one's going to watch when it's Reds Cubs. We'll be right back here on the early line. If you want to pick like a pro, you need to be in the know. The future of sports gaming is now, and we take you inside the lines, breaking down all the action and what it means for your bet slip. Turn down the game and tune into Sports Grid Radio. Other networks talk sports talk, but we walk the walk right up to the window. Sports Grid Radio. Listen free on the Sports Grid Radio app, iHeart, or tune in, or catch us on Sirius XM Sports Grid Channel 159. Maurice Allen, 2015-2016 European Long Drive Tour Champion, 2017 World Number One. Me personally, I keep my game face on me all the time. Especially coming out of the bunker, leaving the range, or even leaving the course. What's your story? The early line. This actually was a positive sign from the Lakers because at least these guys are talking, trying to repair that relationship. And also, it doesn't hurt that they finally put out a positive leak on the Lakers side of this because nonstop negativity has been the tone as it pertains to Russ and L.A. Only on SportsGrid. The morning after. The starter for the AL is Shane, Man- Shane McClanahan, but maybe Shohei will pitch at a certain point, but Shohei will lead off in that spot. And it's the first pitch of the game to Shohei Otani. The betting favorite right now is a strike or a foul tip. That's even money, plus 100. But why not take a shot? Why not sprinkle that Shohei makes some contact, puts one into play? That's plus 550. Any other outcome. We're going for plus money tonight at the All-Star Game. The Sports Grid Network. Fantasy Sports Today. I don't know where I'm at on DeAndre Hopkins. We only played in 10 games last season. He had a nagging injury that crushed his efficiency all year. I am the definition of out on DeAndre Hopkins. There's no way I'm dealing with this. When was the last time we've seen a player who's been suspended to come back and did some damage? All right? I mean, they always seem to get that soft tissue injury because they're not quite shaped. They've been out. The Sports Grid Network. Pharrell, coast to coast. What he has done, Scott, is just, it's old school, man. I mean, a guy that when he throws, if I'm a relief pitcher, I'm like, all right, I got the night off, I guess, because he's not going to let me come into the game. Uh, He's just going to basically tell Magley, like, sit your ass down in the dugout. I'm going to finish this game because I can't trust the bullpen. The guy is eight, nine innings, 100, 105, 110, 115. The Sports Grid Network.
back right here on the early line. Taking a look at the make-miss playoff markets on the FanDuel Sportsbook, which are here now as we head into the second half of the Major League Baseball season. We begin in the National League, and there are a couple of teams we do not have odds for. The Dodgers, the Mets, and the Braves. The expectation, those teams are home free. The Dodgers, three and a half games better than the rest of the league. The Mets and the Braves with decent-sized gaps against the Padres, who are the fourth-best team right now. And that's where this all begins. The big minus-money favorites right now are the Padres and the Milwaukee Brewers. So that's where I want to start here, Donnie, when we, took, when we take a look at this. Do you have any interest in potentially grabbing plus money or maybe laying juice if, if it so fits your eye frame there on the Padres and the Brewers' odds when we're looking at making or missing this upcoming postseason? I, I got to tell you, like if we're looking at the numbers, and, and, and granted, you're right, the Padres minus 340, yes, to make the playoffs. The Milwaukee Brewers minus 290 to make the playoffs as a yes. Both of those teams probably should get in. But I think the odds are correct in this market, Kevin, where I'm looking at the Padres here as they sit there. If the season ended today, they would be in the playoffs as the second wild card behind the Atlanta Braves and then close behind there, the Phillies and the Cardinals. Now, when you say, okay, the Milwaukee Brewers are in first place in the division, they just have to hold that. They'll get in. They don't have to go to a wild card. I understand that. But if I'm looking just at a perspective where I'm looking talent-wise here for the San Diego Padres and also the rumor mill, because that's what you have to include here, Kevin, when you come up against a trade deadline. Who's willing to make moves? Who might be a seller? And who's looking to push forward? Because the one thing that we do know about the Padres having had Fernando Tatis the entire season, if you get back in, in any semblance of what he was in the past, late August into September, that is a bonus. But how about this? When we're starting to hear about Juan Soto, he's going to come up a few times here in these conversations on make or miss the playoffs. One of those teams right at the top of that list with prospects and let it be known out there that they might be willing to deal. That's the Padres getting Juan Soto in that lineup. So if you can tell me right now, Manny Machado, Juan Soto, Fernando Tatis in September, and they're in the mix. They're going to make the playoffs. Am I going to lay a minus 340 price here on the Padres to make it? No, because I think there's some other options out there that might make better dollars and cents. But if I'm looking for the Padres right now, nothing has really given me pause on laying that money if you wanted to do so, because I do believe, Kevin, they are a playoff team and they'll get there. Yeah, I think that's totally reasonable. We're not at a point yet, right, where you're looking at that Padres schedule saying, okay, this this can't Ooh. be, they're going to fall apart, right? And by the yeah. way, I do have some strength of schedule stuff that we will talk about uh, in just a minute here as it pertains to these races. But I think the Padres are solid. I've talked about fading Milwaukee before, but it's been in the divisional odds. And those numbers have kind of fluctuated between being over, overinflated and trying to correct themselves. They were, again, over like minus 230, before, almost going before the All-Star break, now down to minus 160. There's been plenty of opportunity to bet the Cardinals to win that division. I think at very, very legitimate prices that you would be happy about if you have them out there and could take your chances. You could probably even reasonably hedge off them if you felt so inclined. The next group here checks in with the St. Louis Cardinals and the Philadelphia Phillies. The expectation is, at least with these minus numbers perhaps, well, oh, both teams could find themselves into the postseason picture. That is not true. Only one of these teams, if we ultimately are going to say the Dodgers, Mets, and Braves, which I think we are going to make it, and then the Padres are going to make it right, ah, oh, the Brewers perhaps win their division, there is one spot left for the Phillies and the Cardinals. Here is one of the most interesting things out there, though, Donnie. The easiest second half remaining schedule belongs, again, this is currently based on teams' records, the St. Louis Cardinals. But the third easiest remaining strength of schedule belongs to the Philadelphia Phillies. Both of these teams are expected to rack up a lot of wins in the second half. Yes, and they're pretty evenly priced here, and rightfully so. If we take a look at roster construction, superstar power for me probably would end up with the Philadelphia Phillies. Frontline starting pitching, Aaron Nola, Zach Wheeler. You know, Bryce Harper is due to come back four to six weeks from that injury, so he's probably on that timeline where you might see him in August here. And if they're around that race, John Middleton, the owner, has been known to spend money. Hey, look, we don't have great prospects. Let's go overextend ourselves with a Nick Castellanos and a Schwarber and a Bryce Harper making that big money, re-signing a JT Realmuto. They have reached out in the past. Now, also, the Philadelphia Phillies bullpen has sort of turned that corner, Kevin, over the past 30 days. But if we're looking at overall roster construction and where it works, it's probably the St. Louis Cardinals. Solid starting pitching, 
very good lineup and a bullpen with a lot of arms that throw in the high 90s and low triple digits. And also you're talking about what division are you playing in? Top dog in that division, St. Louis Cardinals, Milwaukee Brewers, and there's not a lot to be desired behind them where you can stack up victories. Because even though the Philadelphia Phillies, Kevin, had a great series down in South Florida against the Marlins, that's not the norm. There are four good baseball teams in that division outside of the Nationals that can give them problems. And this is me. Like, I just I haven't seen it yet, Kevin. It's not like, hey, Donnie, why are you so down on your Phillies? Well, I don't know. They haven't made the playoffs in a decade, which included a season that was shortened where basically everybody made it and the Phillies didn't make it. I need to see it to believe it. And I need Bryce Harper to come back in MVP form after missing about a month and a half. He's just going to snap his fingers, Kevin, and pick it up right away saying, I'm the MVP and let me get back on my horse. I haven't seen it from the Phillies. So if I'm looking at both of these teams, the Cardinals or the Phillies to make the playoffs, I got to say right now, it's probably going to be the Cardinals. I think the Cardinals edge can also be that if the Milwaukee Brewers by chance fall apart, the Cardinals can just yeah. make it in as the division winner. Yep. The Phillies are not really a team we're taking serious, uh, taking serious as a potential division winner. Thirty to one right now in that market. Here's the one thing I will say, because of course, it, perhaps now we'll see. Only one of them makes the postseason. This is where these updated win totals get interesting. Both teams are at eighty six and a half for a win total, and I'll just take the Phillies right now. They are forty nine and forty three, a flat seventy games. Remaining, they would need to go 38 and 32 in those final 70 to cash the over 86 and a half. Donnie, with that remaining schedule, you, yeah. I mean, when you take a look at this right here, they have about 40 games made up of playing against the Nationals, Marlins, Reds, Cubs, and Pirates. It is, I think, reasonable to try and back the Phillies with the win total, maybe more so than just the straight make the playoffs number right there. Yeah, I think it makes sense. It's almost like a correlation, right? You're probably more likely to take it down. If the Phillies, first of all, can't play six games over 500 in the second half of the Major League Baseball season, they're not a playoff team. So you're looking for a team that's probably going to go at least 10 games over, maybe 12 or 13 games over to solidify that. But you're right. If you're asking the market where there's a legitimate chance that they might miss the playoffs by going six games above 500 there and that win total, I'll take the win total over the make the playoff market for sure. Now, the one team that we haven't talked about yet, if you saw our graphic on the television side, the numbers on the Giants were not exactly spot on, so I'll clean those up here just to give you guys an indication. They are favored to actually miss the postseason, the San Francisco Giants right now, which is very interesting coming into the year. They're obviously were not as high of expectations for a repeat performance, but this was baseball's best team last year from that record perspective. Plus 120, yes. Minus 148, no. Only a half game behind the Phillies and the Cardinals. Any juice for you on backing San Fran? I mean, I guess pedigree from an organizational standpoint, right? They're used to getting into the playoffs, and even when guys are doubting, like myself, doubting them the entire stretch of the 2021 Major League Baseball season, and there they were, division winners. I, I don't leave them out. They're the type of organization that does have some pretty good frontline starting pitching, playing in a pitcher's ballpark, and you have a manager in Gabe Kapler that's a little bit, you know, outside of the box, which could help you there. And also, we're talking about a team that's sometimes forgotten, 48 and 43, still having a decent season. Now, the reason why we don't talk about them as much is because last year they were a 100-win ball club and holding off the ultra-talented Dodgers. I don't turn my back yet just yet on the San Francisco Giants, and that's an organization, Kevin, that, again, at the trade deadline, might be able to bolster an extra bat, an extra bullpen arm. They'll be in it right down to the wire. I believe that. I don't want to say that I think they're going to be horrendous or anything of the nature. However, compared to the Phillies and the Cardinals, this is the team that has the 11th most difficult schedule in the second half of the season, which includes, and this will get Donnie immediately off the Giants, 14 games against yeah. the Los Angeles Dodgers, plus another yeah. nine against the San Diego Padres. Mm. That's where things get a little bit difficult. Let's talk about that AL wild card race next. Sports Grid, your 24-7 sports wagering network. 
people are going to the betting window betting and betting them the now rail. before the trade takes place. How Diamond dare bets. they do what's fiscally responsible? Let's see how it plays out. Buffalo's going all in right Football now. Football full circle. All their chips in the middle of the table. It's do or die for And God being out. They, they've had a little bit of a shakeup. In-game live all access. You could take the points. You could take the money line. And we had to go to San Jose too. Maybe a small playoff chance. I'm gonna go both underdogs here. I don't want to hear it anymore. Wow! In game live, prime time. He plays time. like he did in game five. They are gonna be all good in game six at home. But boy, you want to give the eight and a half points with a desperate team facing elimination? Get the winning edge only on Sports Grid, your 24/7 sports wagering network. If you want to pick like a pro, you need to be in the know. The future of sports gaming is now, and we take you inside the lines, breaking down all the action and what it means for your bet slip. Turn down the game and tune into Sports Grid Radio. Other networks talk sports talk, but we walk the walk right up to the window. Sports Grid Radio. Listen free on the Sports Grid Radio app, iHeart, or tune in, or catch us on Sirius XM Sports Grid Channel 159. The morning after. That it means more for the league where it always just means more to add Texas and Oklahoma than the Big Ten adding USC and UCLA. Texas comes in with its own network uh, that has mm. its own set of advertisers and money and everything else that they'll fold into the SEC. I know you as a perennial uh, college football playoff team contender. Will Maybe. they be that in the SEC? No, but they are a team that brings that sort of prestige with them. The Sports Grid Network. You might be the next Daily Fantasy Millionaire. No matter what you watch or where you play, learn from the world's best DFS players. Lineup building tools, expert projections, and advanced stats change the way you play the game. Dominate the competition. DailyRoto.com, the player's choice. Pharrell, coast to coast. He is finished. He'll come back next year. It'll happen again, and he'll never pitch again. That'll be the end of it. I, I think that Strasburg had his he had his moment in that World Series when the Nationals won it. He gave it all out, that, and he, he had injury problems before that. And now he just hasn't been able to stay on the field since. Uh, it's unfortunate, but I think that he is finished. The Sports Grid Network. than the one in the National League. Right now, there are a lot of teams jumbled up together and some teams that we did not expect to be there. Let's start at the top. The teams that are heavily favored to make the postseason. There's three of them right now, Donnie, that are above minus 200. The Toronto Blue Jays with a big number. That shines on them positively. Minus 500. Yes, you got a minus 245 mm. number on Tampa Bay right now. And the red hot, still 14-game win streak that carries into the break here on the Seattle Mariners at minus 205. Any of those front three numbers catch your interest? I got to tell you, like if, if we're taking a look at those, you know, guys that are in, if, as we like to say, if the season ended today, numbers, right? Rays would be in, Mariners would be in, and the Blue Jays. Now, there's a couple teams behind them, but I got to tell you, I'm starting to believe the Seattle Mariners. I don't want to say they're the truth, Kevin, as if they're going to do damage in the playoffs. But I look at them right now, 51 and 42. Why should they slide off here? Like, okay, you play in a division with the Astros. The rest of the teams in that division you could beat down, and you could certainly pile up wins against. And they seem to have a formula that's working out. And the joke that we had last year in the 2021 season was, man, Mariners really expected their front office to help them out, but somehow traded Mariano Rivera mixed with Raleigh Fingers at the trade deadline and ruined their entire season. Because, again, grown men were crying in the dugout because a middling reliever got traded to a divisional uh, yeah. divisional team. So wow. if we take a look this year with the Mariners at 51-42, and 42, I think what they have, the, what it takes, they're a game up here. But if I'm looking at the teams behind them, I trust the Mariners, if not more than any of the teams behind them here. I think the Mariners, even at a two-to-one price, Kevin, I think they get in the playoffs. I do. 
Look, I obviously, they are red, red hot right now. And here's the big boost for Seattle compared. <laughs> Kendall Graveman, man, shout out. A legend oh of the God. early line. Can we just honestly. go back to like that? You, we have a picture. Yeah. We, when, I'm just, when you talk about early line legends, like, you might be surprised to see Kendall Graveman make the list, but he, he really warrants his spot uh, in history. Man. Here's the deal with the Seattle Mariners, though. They have the sixth easiest strength of schedule for the second half of the season. The benefit of not being in the AL East, which actually features all five teams mm. inside the top 10. Why? Because they all have to play each other the entire way. That's the big difference maker there. So to me, it becomes very interesting. Because if I were to try and tell you, okay, one of Toronto or Tampa could miss, well, I can't try and sell you on Boston making it, who has the second most difficult schedule during the second half of the season. It would require a Guardians, perhaps, or maybe even a Chicago White Sox. Before we get to those teams, I will say, though, Donnie, the minus 500 on Toronto does not feel warranted. It doesn't. I understand they had huge expectations coming into the year, but they have not lived up to that billing. Again, you mentioned, yes, Tampa, Seattle, and Toronto would all be in, but the worst record of that group does belong to the Blue Jays. You could absolutely, I think, argue pure value plus 360 on Toronto to miss. It's it's an interesting point you bring up because some of these expectations, Kevin, that we're looking at at the All-Star break are the same ones that, quite frankly, we had before the season. Well, the Blue Jays are so talented, there's no way they can be left out. And granted, if this season ended today, the Toronto Blue Jays would be headed to the playoffs. We have to understand that. We're also anticipating that that front office is not going to give up on the season and say, boy, we're really talented. We gave you enough for the season. We're not going to help you at the deadline. Throw out a bat, throw out a reliever, maybe a starting pitcher here to help buoy them. But if I'm looking at that Toronto Blue Jays and you sort of slide the card down, Boston Red Sox, Cleveland Guardians, Baltimore Orioles, Chicago White Sox, legitimately with chances to make the playoffs. Behind them, the Texas Rangers at seven and a half games back of the de- of the uh, wild card race. I-, I don't think they're in. But if we look at those teams, the Toronto Blue Jays have a lot of Chicago White Sox in them, don't they? Where you started this Major League Baseball season and rightfully so saying, who are some of the more talented teams in the American League? Immediately, you're looking towards the Toronto Blue Jays and the Chicago White Sox on those lines. But I have to tell you right now, if I'm looking at just between those two teams, and again, the Blue Jays have a better record than the White Sox. I trust the Blue Jays a little bit more than the White Sox at this point, but even if we're taking a look at farther down that list, the Chicago White Sox still coming in here at the FanDuel Sportsbook at a minus 142 to make the playoffs. That's a lot of leaps of faith by saying like, hey, I really like them, Kevin, which I did to start the season. But I got to tell you, on the White Sox, I'm out on them right now. Mm. I don't think they get in. I'm not paying a minus 142 price for them to say, hey, Kevin, you'll get it together. We're three months into the season. They haven't gotten it together. The White Sox are bang 500 right now. They have won seven of their last 10. They're three and a half back of the Toronto Blue Jays. The thing that, of course, is very interesting as it pertains to the White Sox is they're also only three back of their division. And if you look through their odds, ultimately, to win the division, they've never really jumped ship on that team. The Twins are plus 120. The White Sox are plus 125. And if Minnesota struggles a little bit there, perhaps that is a pathway to success for the White Sox. Now, I totally agree in that you're not getting me to lay in minus 142 on Chicago right now. I don't think they've earned that number either, but I'm not running to fade them at this moment. Here is the number I think from this AL wildcard race I'm most interested in. It is a minus number. Last year, you and I did this exact show at this exact time. We reset the markets, and I laid a little bit of juice on the Blue Jays to miss the postseason. I think I might do the same thing again here with the Boston Red Sox. The Boston Red Sox have the second most difficult strength of schedule left in baseball. Not just having to play the AL East, but a series with the Astros, a series with the Atlanta Braves, and a couple other contenders along the way. The other thing for the Boston Red Sox is playing the AL East is not just difficult because obviously the whole division is solid. It's because the Boston Red Sox have been pitiful against the AL East. Donnie, they have won 12 AL East games this year, 12 and 26. You know how many teams have fewer division victories than the Boston Red Sox? Two of them, the Nationals 
and the Athletics, the two teams that we talked about with the worst records in all of Major League Baseball, the Boston Red Sox have been beat up by their own, and I don't have much of a reason to think that's going to change. And here's the added incentive, Donnie, and tell me if you buy into this at all. What if they become sellers in just a couple of weeks' time here? I mean, at the end of the day, all of their big names are going to become free agents, it feels like, at the end of the season. Maybe they're not. Look, I don't think they're trading a Rafael Devers. I'm not telling you that. But J.D. Martinez, I could believe it. Xander Bogarts, maybe if the offer is right. I think Boston, to miss the playoffs, which, by the way, you'll see on our graphic there, was not minus 134 this morning. People have been betting the no, and I agree, Donnie. Yeah, no, you're right about it, too, because you were hoping to get sort of that midseason surge. They were terrible to start the season. You say, boy, what's in the cards here for the Red Sox at this point? And you thought maybe that immediately they would be sellers. They catch fire here, and they say, hold on now. It's a good chance that we can make the playoffs. We're not going to catch the Yankees, but it is about getting into the tournament here at the end of the season to see if you could do some damage. And we're a big market. Our fan base expects us to do so. And they said, all right, well, Chris Sale's coming back here. We might be able to add an arm at the deadline, maybe an extra bat, a bullpen reliever. And let's see if we can get into the wild card and do some damage. Well, you just lost Chris Sale. Who knows? Maybe for the remainder of the year, you limp into the deadline here, three and seven over your last 10 games. And you have a lot of question marks where sometimes players, Kevin, could make those business decisions. Hey, I don't know if I'm going to be here next year. I don't want to get injured here because I have big money coming up on the docket. Some of those things do feed into it, but if there is one team here that I would be looking to fade as well, it would be the Boston Red Sox, and you're right. You don't get that feasibility of saying, all right, well, three or four games back of the division, we could win that. Three or four games back of the wild card, we could get that. It's a one-way street here for the Red Sox, and it's only by wild card. But you're right. In the next two to three weeks, what happens if they open up out of the deadline here, excuse me, after the All-Star break and before the deadline and lose, let's just say, win three games, lose nine games, something like that? You might be looking at sellers here, which is incredible to think about in Boston, but there's a more likelihood for me that there's sellers at the deadline or not buyers, I should say, than actually buying at the deadline. Yeah, which is fascinating. Now, the series that they play before is going to be a three-pack in Kansas City, four in Baltimore, and then three versus Cleveland. The thing is, that mm. four versus Baltimore has a lot of a, a much different feel probably than we had anticipated. Yeah. Dottie, they have the same exact record as the Chicago White Sox, bang 46 and 46 right now on the Baltimore Orioles. 12 to 1 to make the playoffs. An updated win total of 75 and a half, which is 14 more wins than their preseason over under on a win total. What are you thinking about Baltimore here in the second half? Nice story that comes to a close. We're talking about Boston selling. Is Baltimore going to still sell or could they buy? What's your take on the O's? Yeah, what a wild card team is like to say, pun intended here for the Orioles, because they weren't supposed to be in this spot. The front office wasn't looking at this season as a competitive season. Let's see what we have in some young players, retool in the offseason, and basically see what happens into the future as you build through the draft, getting number one pick after number one pick and see if they can come up. But now that they're factors in the race, but also you're still trying to take a look at what makes sense for the Orioles, because I understand there's two trains of thoughts here on the Orioles for me, Kevin. It's one where the organization says, hey, Guys, you got our back, man. You're 46 and 46. We didn't expect this to happen. Let's help you a little bit here just to give you that sort of wind in your sail to play the rest of the year. But if you're looking from a traditional standpoint for the Orioles, it doesn't even make sense at this point. Like, what are you actually doing? Are you getting a lot of fans in, at, at, down at uh, Oriole Park at Camden Yards? Probably not. They have expectations of winning a championship. No, they don't. So do you move a couple pieces here at the deadline, like a Trey Mancini, and say, hey, look, we're really retooling for the next two to three years, not this year, and sort of take the wind out of the sails? It's an interesting one for me. But if I'm the Orioles, I think as an organization, you owe it to the team there not to be buyers, but don't be sellers at the mm-hmm. deadline. Come on. And and I, that is the thing. I don't think they are going to be sellers, but I also don't think they're going to be anywhere near as good. I'll tell you the number I think yeah, you hit on Baltimore, so and we'll make that transition over to the win total market right here on the early line.
your heart's racing. The clock's running out. It all comes down to this. We're talking pregame. 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 Get locked in with game time decisions. Your hosts, Gabe Marinci and Cam Stewart, will get you ready for game time. Everything you need to know before a game goes off the board with the best slips to back it up. Make your best bet with live odds updates, late breaking news, up to the minute injury reports, and real time analytics from inside the sports books. All the odds, all the action from sports wagering insiders and industry pros like Donnie Wrightside, Cam Lou, Cousin Sal, the pro football doc, Dr. David Chow, and more. Get the winning edge every weekday afternoon from 6 to 7 p.m. Eastern, 3 to 4 Pacific. It's game time decisions only on Sports Grid. Pro Football Doc has found its new home right here with Sports Injury Central. And with that comes our expansion into other sports. Sports Injury Central will give you nonstop exclusive injury analysis from experienced team doctors from all three major sports. Doctors with resumes that include teams like the Chicago Bulls, the Texas Rangers, and the LA Chargers. So gain a fantasy DFS and betting edge right now for free at SICscore.com. The early line. But overall, I mean, this is as good a performance as you're going to find in professional sports. When you talk about like the dunk competition, this is by far better than the dunk competition at this point. These guys are getting after it and enjoying themselves. They, they definitely are. I'm not sure if there really is any all-star side event that stacks up right now to the home yeah. run derby. It's, it's in a way, it's it's simplicity is what gets the job done. Only on Sports Grid. Fantasy Sports Today. For right now, Matt Carpenter, if you had the uh, the fortitude to pick him up off the waivers, what an unbelievable beginning to the season he is having for the New York Yankees. Batting 350, 13 home runs. I mean, this guy could not record a hit, George, for the rest of the season. You could drop him. He could get hurt. It doesn't matter. He has already boosted you so far up the standings. The Sports Grid Network. Pharrell, coast to coast. I was with a heavy today, right? And I told him that USC was getting the bulk of the action on winning a national championship because they stole that coach from Norman, Oklahoma, that he's going to come to Los Angeles and win a national championship in his first year with that crappy football team. Has anyone not noticed how crappy they've been the last 10 years? The Sports Grid Network. Baltimore Orioles conversation, but it works perfectly as we make the transition to the updated win totals on the FanDuel Sportsbook. This number on Baltimore, Donnie, again, could you imagine telling somebody that you were even going to see a 75 and a half at the midway point for this O's team? 70 games remaining for Baltimore with 46 wins on the table. Pretty easy math. You're going to need 30 to come your direction. 30 and 40 is well below the marker that this team has been playing at. With that being said, I do think your play is the under. 14 additional wins on their preseason number. Donnie, they only, only have 39 AL East games remaining. Six against the Yankees, seven against the Rays, 11 against the Red Sox, and 15 games against the Toronto Blue Jays for this Baltimore Orioles team. They've been awesome and fun to follow. But I think updated 75 and a half, you go under that number. Yeah, I'm going under that total. I am as well. I mean, they certainly are playing way above their pay grade, as we like to say, at 46 and 46 on the season. And imagine that, right? Hey, man, this team's 500 to break. Boy, they're way better than we thought. What type of organization do you actually have where everybody expected you to stink? And now that you're 500, we're like, you know, we're having a ticker tape parade for your organizational team here. But if I'm looking from an Orioles perspective, I'm with you here. What type of damage are we doing down the line? Are we going to win games against your division? Are we going to hang around in the thick of a playoff race when, quite frankly, our raw 
roster isn't nearly as talented as the teams around us. Usually sooner than later, the cream does rise to the top. And I don't think the Baltimore Orioles are going to be around to find that 80 win marker with a chance at going into the playoffs. I just think it falls apart in the second half. And it's not, it's not the Orioles fault. They're not destined to win this year. They're destined to win in a couple years, the way they're playing this out. 100%. I agree with you though. Like he shouldn't be sellers, but also is anybody going to kill him if they are right? I, you know what I mean? Like, if, if they're young guys, you shouldn't be selling. But if they move a couple of pieces, I think you would even understand it from that perspective. Now, let's talk about the best teams in Major League Baseball. Save these five here. We can get to any others if we have time. But I wanted to save these five for this conversation here because we don't have the odds for these teams to make or miss the playoffs because the idea is they're absolutely going to be in. And it begins with the New York Yankees. Updated win total, 105 and a half. It is plus 100 to the over. At 64 and 28, this would require the Yankees to go out there and win 60% of their second half games. They nearly won 70% of their first half games. Any jumping off point for you on the Yankees updated number? I would definitely lean towards the under here. It sounds crazy because if you have the talent to get 106 wins or even maybe threaten the Seattle Mariners' all-time record, they actually do, Kevin. But if I'm trying to be concise here with my you know, prognosis of the Yankees, let's say, heading down the stretch, they're going to have this wrapped up. I doubt their 13-game lead is going to disappear by late you know, to middle September. September 16th, hey, the Yankees lead is down the one versus the Rays. I don't think that's going to happen. So what I'm getting at here is you start to set up your rotation on the back end. You start to give some of your players time off instead of playing six days a week out of the seven games. Maybe you play four over those final two weeks to get prepared and get refreshed for the playoffs. And also, if we're looking at that, Running mates, Kevin. The reason why last year, why the Dodgers and the Giants were so much fun to watch and putting up ridiculous numbers because every single game mattered. Like the joke was, man, the Dodgers went 9-1 and one and lost a game in the standings to the San Francisco Giants to how hot they were. Who's pushing the Yankees at the end of the season? Now, I did say they are extremely talented. And if they're healthy, it doesn't matter what's taking place over the final two weeks of the season. They should get this. But if I'm just looking from a perspective for myself saying, why do we really need to press that gas pedal over the final two weeks? I don't know if I see it here for the Yankees. I'll just take the under based on that. Yankees would be a good team. Yankees still might have the best team in baseball, but I don't know where that want is over the final two weeks and the need is. Do we really need these final three games or are we just wrapping up this heading into the playoffs at that point? I actually think I can give you an answer to that. 13 games up on the Rays. There's no competition. You would anticipate coming from there. If there is, then they are going to be under their win total as is. It's the four and a half game lead on the Houston Astros. Because for the Yankees, this is not about winning the AL East anymore. Honestly, Donnie, it might even arguably kind of have to do with just a three-game lead on the Los Angeles Dodgers. The Yankees are going to want home field advantage throughout. They are 37-12 and at Yankee Stadium this year. They have been fantastic playing in the Bronx. And that matters. So I still think they'll have plenty of incentive there. The Yankees also have to be one of the most aggressive buyers at the deadline. This is a franchise, obviously, everybody knows. They've won a gang of World Series. But the temperature around it has been a while. It's been a while since the Yankees, it feels like, have won a World Series there. The team in town, the New York Mets, have been to a World Series more recently than the New York Yankees. And they bring Steve Cohen in, who keeps trying to say he's going to throw around his weight. Maybe he'll bid on Aaron Judge. Maybe he's going to be bidding on a Juan Soto. The Yankees have to stay aggressive. And here is the reason why I think you can go over the 105 and a half. If you were betting on them, Donnie, to keep a 70% percentage win percentage, okay, that's a bridge too far. But 60% in terms of a win percentage, well, that's a little bit more reasonable. Pretty much all the teams we're talking about here have won 60% of their games. If the Yankees are all of a sudden playing 500 baseball, I actually think that could be a little bit of a sign of concern around them and maybe say, okay, did they kind of peak a little bit too early in the season? And I don't think that's going to be the case. Yeah, and they added on last year the deadline. The Yankees also, you have to take a look at a team that's as good as the Yankees, right? Well ahead. An organizational standpoint is not going to be Brian Cashman deadline. Go, hey, we got what we need. Look how good our record is. We don't need to add any more. 
They're going to go out there and look for the Louis Castillos of the world, maybe a, a good number two or a good number three, another bat here just for matchups in the playoffs, right? Maybe get another solid left-handed batter, another solid right-handed batter, even how good that relieving core has been, add another piece to the puzzle. So you're right about that. This Yankees team that we see right now heading out of the All-Star break on 720, in about two weeks' time, they're probably going to be an even better ball club talent-wise here as long as they stay healthy the rest of the way. So there is some additives there to, toward the end of the season saying, hey, we might not need those last two weeks. We might already have this thing wrapped up with our team total in the pocket. I'm just going with an advantage point where I don't know if we have those blinders on like final two weeks of the season. Let's really dig in and go 12 and two on our way out. We will do a head to head of Mets Braves in just a moment there, but I want to talk about the only other two teams that have an above 100 win total projection right now, which is the Dodgers and the Astros, the Dodgers 103 and a half, the Astros 101 and a half. Your choice. Either one of those teams over or under peak your interest going into the second half of this season. I mean, you can take a look at the Dodgers, 103 and a half. I mean, that's basically what we pencil them in for every year at this point, winning 100 games. So they're going to be in that marketplace. But maybe it's the Houston Astros at this point, Kevin. And you brought up a pretty good topic here when you talk about the Yankees and the Astros. Maybe mm -hmm. the Astros have that carrot and say, well, we're so far up in our division. Nobody's going to catch us. Maybe we don't have the blinders on as opposed to, hey, guys. Everywhere we go on the road, we get resoundingly booed. L.A., Los mm -hmm. Angeles, regulars, all-star games. It doesn't matter. Everybody hates us. You know what's a little bit better? Have home field advantage with more home games than away games. Maybe they take that approach here because they're talented as well. They're going to make moves at the deadline. But I can't say for sure. Hey, Donnie, you don't like the Yankees, but you like the Astros, even though the formality is the same. They're going to walk away with their divisions. But maybe just mm -hmm. being saying, I'm that top dog being the Yankees, and maybe you're the Astros with a little bit of an axe to grind saying, we'll show you fans here. We'll come from behind and overtake the Yankees. And, yeah, you got to come down to all ball, our ballpark here, and maybe we can bang some trash cans or even put the notion, are they cheating? They scored six runs in game one. Are they cheating again? Put that in the back of the Yankees' head. Listen, I'll tell you this right now. I think the Astros are going to make it competitive, though it does feel like we hear less about them maybe entering the deadline. Obviously, they've got a very good roster, but yeah. uh, we'll see what they want to do. I'll mention this on the Dodgers quickly. If they win 104 games, that would put them at a 60, uh, a point six four two win percentage, which is fantastic. They have been over that three years in a row. I'm using the win percentage there so I can count the pandemic season to give you that perspective. Actually, that year they won 72% of their baseball games. A ridiculous year, truthfully, that season. But it gives you an idea for the Dodgers. While that might sound, again, ridiculous, 104 wins, it kind of has become the normal for the Los Angeles Dodgers. That is how good they are. Now, it reasonably can come down to the final games of the season. That's why I wanted to bring this up. Would you believe me, Don, if I told you the last six games, so crazy, the last six games of the Dodgers season are all home games against the Colorado Rockies? Every single one of them. Six consecutive home games to end it. To where, Donnie, if I start at 98 wins and I need to go 6-0, and I think I would take my chances that they could sweep the Dodgers six consecutive games in their own stadium against the Rockies. Or the way some of the Dodgers games have played out in 2022, do you actually Catch. want to play like the Padres or the Giants here because they get engaged? <laughs> I was almost waiting for you to tell me like they had the Pirates six games at the end of the schedule yeah. and they just would whip us. And, Whoa, that sounds like five and one to the Pirates yeah. at that point here. So mm -hmm. it is a double-edged sword as we're joking. But no, you look at the schedule and you say, if you need three or four wins in that last series, the Rockies are coming to town probably out of it saying, hey, like, what are we winning these games for? And let's have a couple of nice nights out here to end the season in Los Angeles. That would make more sense here where the Dodgers should be able to pummel them. Yeah, certainly so. Look, let's do this head-to-head -head here, Mets Braves, right? This is kind of how, for a lot of people, the top five teams in Major League Baseball round out. The New York Mets and the Atlanta Braves have a lot of baseball, by the way, to play against one another. Twelve games between these teams in the second half. We saw the Mets grab that series in Atlanta, and it helped them secure their status inside the NL East. Minus 195 to the Braves, plus 165. It is a three-game gap on the win total. 98.5 for the Mets, 95.5 for the Atlanta Braves. What are we thinking here, Donnie, with the second half between these two teams in the NL East? 
Aren't we waiting for doom and gloom now, Kevin, for the Mets? Is it gone too far where the Mets, hey, walk away. They might win 115 games and easily win this division. Then you start losing some starting pitchers here. Maybe the lineup isn't turning over as you anticipated. But again, you still want to have a deep-pocketed owner that is going to make changes at the deadline. But now you hear coming out of the break, eh, Jacob DeGrom maybe not ready just yet here. And isn't the pedigree down in Atlanta with that front office? We're going to make moves that make sense at the deadline to propel our team. So if I'm looking right now, July 20th, heading out of the All-Star break, it's still got to be the Atlanta Braves for me. And it shouldn't be that way. The Mets should have walked away with this division with the talent in that front office, excuse me, with the talent on that front line starting pitching and also that one through nine lineup. And they didn't. So the momentum for me here is with the Atlanta Braves in the second half. And don't be surprised if the Braves make some very shrewd moves at the deadline as opposed to the big splash moves that the Mets want to be. We're talking about not making front page headlines. We're talking about winning baseball games. Dare I say, I'll take the Atlanta Braves team total over before I take the Mets team total over. I understand if, again, just, you know, three less wins maybe feels valuable. There is, though... Right now, the Mets have two more wins on their plate currently and one more game to play. So you can kind of tell the expectations there are the same. We talk about that strength of schedule. 13th most difficult for the Atlanta Braves, 23rd most difficult for the New York Mets. And while the Braves made great moves to the deadline last year, Cohen has promised to deliver at the deadline if the team needs it. Oh, and by the way, at some point, the best pitcher in the sport, Jacob DeGrom, comes back which will be the most valuable second-half addition any team makes all year long. Give me the best. Early line closes out next. Sports Grid, your 24-7 sports wagering network. They played last game. The early line. Take a look at the top four seeds here in the Big Ten. They're going to play less. Aaron Rodgers and the morning the after. Wilson. We saw movement in the marketplace like Orlando. Fantasy Magic. sports the today. The Cavaliers are a little thin as well. Newswire. Minus 160 favorite on the money line today for Arizona. Pharrell coast to coast. That's where they win cups. Stanley Cups over there. Give me the game penalty. time decision. Kind of bizarre when you consider like so everybody is out for the Warriors. In game live I all like access. Vandy. I like Vandy against Bam. I think Vandy can win the game, take a corner. In half. game oh, live man. prime oh, yeah, time. Major, the PGA champion. In yes. game live overtime. All done before the final bet. Get the game. winning edge only on Sports Grid. The early line. Do you think a Big 12, Pac-12 merger would have made sense? No, I don't. I don't. Because when you add more teams in, Kevin, you're going to divvy up more pieces of the pie. It's the reason why you see these big guys leaving. And we're looking right now at these Pac-12 teams, Kevin, and saying to ourselves, what are you actually bringing to the table to the Big 12? Apparently not enough. Only on SportsGrid. The morning after. A Yerfi or a Nerfi, Kev? Well, the Nerfi is the favored side tonight at minus 136 to stay under that half run total in the opening frame. Do you agree that maybe we won't see a run early on? I agree that it should be the favorite. I think if you made me bet it, though, I actually might be inclined to yep. touch the yes. I, 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 I do. I look at the National League lineup and it's all righties. The Sports Grid Network. Sports Professor Rick Harrell, your daily numbers game from Inverness, Scotland, heading to the British Senior Open. But we focus on gaming and we focus on Florida and look at the briefing schedule for the appellate court in the case about the constitutionality of the Indian Gaming Ruling Act, which has been held unconstitutional. About 45 days of legal gaming before the courts shut it down. And now they're in a position of trying to figure out whether or not they will allow it. But the briefing schedule is in the summer, well into the fall, and even into next year. So no avail on the speed of this. Same time, FanDuel DraftKings estimated $37 million overall to put into this pot to try to generate 
dollars for signatures, those signatures didn't work either. And at the end of the day, there is no process for gaming that will involve Florida in the near future. All right, last segment of the day here for the early line on a Wednesday, Sirius XM Channel 159, right here on the Sports Grid Network. Down the right side, myself, along with Kevin Walsh, as always, carrying you guys through from 7 to 9 a.m. before we hand it over to the morning after and Ben Stevens to get the rest of your Sports Grid news and information throughout the day. But yesterday, we just ended the All Star game. We head into the second half of the Major League Baseball season. A lot up in the air, as Kevin and I covered throughout the second half of our show today. But I got to tell you, there's a change here in the All-Star game. And I don't know if it's actually for the best for the fans. Listen up. Be quiet. We love superstars. That's why we watch All-Star games in the NBA. We are blown away by the talent. The two-on-one for three-on-one fast breaks. The shots from the logo that seem to go down with ease. The NHL All-Star Game, free wheeling, wide open, no checks, no fights, and a lot of scoring. So when I bring it back here to, and we're not even going to talk about the NFL, by the way. I mean, forget about that farce of a Pro Bowl. But Major League Baseball, probably the closest thing to a game that you can get for an All-Star Game. And we like that. We do. There's a lot of superstars that we like to watch. I get it here. But quite frankly, the pitchers are becoming too much of a star in this game. And at least we do get the home run derby on Monday night before the All-Star game plays each and every year on a Tuesday. But yesterday, 22 total strikeouts in this game. You saw the first, or I should say, what, the first inning where McClanahan gives up the two runs. And then basically nobody reaches base again the rest of the way as the pitching here for the American League was absolutely sensational. We actually got a few home runs in this game, but only five total runs scored. Now, I'm not saying that we can't enjoy a game three to two and watch guys come in as relievers throwing 103 miles an hour. But I got to be honest, I like scoring runs, home runs, a lot more than pitching contests. Could this be a wave of the future where the all-star games are the ultimate under games? It could be, but I certainly hope not. But that'll do it today for this edition of The Early Line. Make sure you stay tuned right here on the network and catch Ben in the morning on the morning after. 